22. And so I have a question to ask actually. You know, how many of you think that you want a change in your life? How many of you think? You can boldly raise hands actually. All right, great. You know, all of us agree that we need to change, right? You can speak to me actually. I will come to you otherwise actually. So I don't stand there anymore. I'm going to walk around and see you because we are not sleeping anymore, right? So we will come back. So how many of you think that we all need change, right? We all agree that as families we want to change, as individuals we want to change, you know, in our relationally we want to change, emotionally we want to change, and the theme for the year that God has given us is transformation to change. That is what we pray. But why we are not changing then? And why we are not able to change then? We all want to do something, but we are not able to do it. Why we are not able to do it? There are many reasons actually. The natural response to man are human beings to change is what? Resistance. Now anything that new that happens, what, what we do? We try to resist it. No, you know, that is our response. First response is no, whether it is good or bad. That is a natural tendency of human beings. Why? Why people resist change? There are many reasons of resisting change. One of the reasons is resistance is because men are the creatures of habit. You know, many of us look at actually the same thing that we do day after day. The same route we take to go to the work. The same seat we come to sit in the church actually. The same food we eat, right? So same thing that we do. And that is the same thing. So we are become comfortable with that thing. And so we don't want to change or we don't know whether we need to change either. That is a reason. One of the reasons is resistance because of we are the creatures of habit. So we talk about habit some other time and we have an old family service talk about habit and its purpose and you know it is its power and all. But that is one reason. The other reason I think it is because of fear. Fear. Fear of the unknown. We know what it is now but we don't know what is next. The fear of uncertainty. Because we are so familiar doing these things and we don't know what is next to come. Remember that Jesus asked that question to the, the man at the, at the pool. 38 long years he was there. Jesus asked him, do you want to get well? What was his answer? He didn't say that yes or no to that answer. He said, I have, I have been here so long and he says, I have nobody to drop here. <laughs> there is no, no, before I go, somebody jump. So now we said this so many times actually after being here and he became the senior most, uh, you know, sick person there. So he tell other people how to jump from which angle to jump, what to do, all kinds of things actually. But he doesn't want to, to jump at all. And he became the union leader there. And he collect the money and all kinds of stuff actually. This become his routine. And he think that there is no hope whatsoever at all. So fear of the unknown, fear of the uncertainty, not only that fear of losing control. That is one of the reasons we don't want to change at all. Now we have some kind of familiarity. We are able to control the things, but we don't know what is going to come. And that may lose our control. So we are not willing to give, our, uh, that, that give up the control uh, to God or to other circumstances. So that is one reason. And there may be another reason also. Not only that we are creatures of habit. Not only we are afraid of the future or what is going to come. Sometimes we are, we are not willing to pay the price to change. Change is costly. It costs us something, right? So what happened? And so we pray, Lord, change and do all these things. But remember that you can have a different result by doing the same thing. You can have a different result, the simple things, by doing the same thing. I want the power. So we need to pray. But we don't have the time to pray. But I want the power. <laughs> right? So we are willing to pay the price. So there may be different reasons that we want to change. Here, Jesus talked about something in Mark chapter 2. Turn your Bible to Mark chapter 2. Verses 18 through 22. The last two words are our, our, our text. But we try to look into all over this place to get the context also over there. Gospel of Mark chapter 2. Verses 18 through 22. If you have the Bible, say Amen. amen. Okay, turn, your, turn towards there and let's read that together. Matthew, Mark chapter 2 verse 18 through 22. Now, John's disciples and Pharisees were fasting. 
Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. Verse 21, no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, otherwise the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskin, otherwise the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. New wine into new wineskins. So Jesus talked about something about transformation one way over here. Remember that we all know that change is only one thing that never changes, right? So one who stands here, who never changes, talking to these people. So this text we have a, one principle I think that we can say. There are four points I will try to say with the same thing. I will repeat that same thing again and again to get into our heart. Look at Mark, Gospel of Mark. Gospel of Mark is the shortest gospel among the gospels. You know, then we see that people traditionally believe that. Mark recorded the sermons of Peter and that is what the gospel of Mark is and you know it is like a motion picture you see the geography and the plot is changing from one to another in Mark it's very interesting to read gospel of Mark the word immediately used 42 times in this uh, in the gospel of Mark change it again and again and again and as we know that Peter is a man of action so he witnessed all these things and he is preaching to other people, teaching to other people. These were the actions. These are the things that Jesus did. These are the things that he taught. So he is trying to explain those things. And Mark recorded those things and writing for us to understand. So it is like a, it's like a journey that go from uh, Galilee to Judea to Jerusalem. And end there with the Jesus crucifixion. And there is no genealogy. There is no much of explanation of any of those things. Just like a sermon note that we get in Gospel of Mark. In chapter 2, and 1 and 2 that we see that Mark is building up this tension between the, the Jewish religious leaders and Jesus. And you show how the tension build up. Look at chapter 1, 2 and all at least this point. We can see that how that is tension is building up over there. The first thing that we see Jesus is shocking the Jewish leaders by his actions, you know. Something they thought are so sacred, he just makes it so ordinary. <laughs> and he's doing certain things, seeing that they cannot believe that at all. Because one side they see that he is doing miracles. The other side he is doing things that they cannot even believe. And the question in their heart is that then how can this man who is able to do that thing and also do this thing also. Look at one after the another this event that happened. Jesus healed a demon possessed person in the synagogue. He was there for a while. The Jewish people couldn't, the leaders couldn't do anything at all. But Jesus taught with authority there and he healed a man in the synagogue. And then he go to the next level of it. Not only that somebody those who are demon possessed in the synagogue, the next one he healed a leper. How did he lead, he lead the, heal the leper? He touched him. Right? So ceremonially, when you touch a leper, what happened? According to Leviticus that we read that uh, they become ceremonially unclean. He was defiled. So he become ceremonially unclean. So he cannot, uh, nobody want to go close. The leper called himself is unclean, unclean as he come. And he is not supposed to be in the group either. But what Jesus did, Jesus could have healed him by Say a word. But he made sure that he went and touched him. So that shocked them. What is he doing? This man become already unclean. Then we see go further. So every time the degree is increasing only. In chapter 2 we see that the paralytic person was brought to Jesus. Opening the roof and brought, brought him down. What did Jesus did there? Jesus not only healed him. Before he healed him he said I forgive you. You see the degree goes then. Once he had just healed a person in the synagogue, then another one touched the leper. Now he claims that he is God. That's blasphemy. He said, I forgive your sins. They thought all of us, who are you to forgive sins? That is the right of God. That is what exactly he did. It is easy to heal. 
But how do you know that his sins are forgiven? So the healing became an attestation of the forgiveness of his sin. That's why Jesus is bringing over there. So this one degree to another, they couldn't stand at all. Then lo and behold, he just walked around. He called the Levi or Matthew, the tax collector, asked him to follow him. This is tax season, right? So nobody like Jeevan, not Jeevan actually, nobody like IRS people, right? Nobody like. So for the Jewish people, a tax collector means what? A tax collector is a traitor. So they have that. So you can see all those places actually, a tax collector equates sinner. A tax collector is automatically a sinner. That's what they see. Not only Jesus called him to follow him, he went a party with him that evening also. Where? Hey? At a if this tax collector's home, they have a party. You know, that's, a, that's a Matthew's evangelism actually. You invite your friends, invite Jesus also, share Jesus with them. That's a Jesus meal idea. That's what exactly that it is. So that is another thing. Not only like that, it goes further. Then you can, you can further, you can see that he healed a person on a Sabbath day. Look at this. The shock that Peter or the Mark is showing in the hearts of these people, they cannot stand at all this. What is happening here? So they were so irritated. They are so annoyed. And they said, what is happening here? Everything that we thought he did, wrong thing, with the wrong people, at the wrong time. You know, Pharisees are, called, the Pharisees are known as the professional whiners. That is their job, professional whiners. You ever seen that people like that? There is people called EGNs, extra grace needed. You know, some people are extra grace needed people actually. In the church and ministry and all, you know that. They need some extra grace. <laughs> we know that. But some people are, you know, chronic complainers. They are Pharisees. That brand comes actually. No matter what you do, no matter what you say, they are the members of the Viners Club. You ever heard of Viners Club? You heard Diners Club. You ever heard of Viners Club? So that's what they are, Viners Club. I know. You ever know that anybody has Viners Club people? Anybody sitting next to you? Are you one? Hi. The prophet, they, they could not stand at all with the Jesus. Pharisees become so irritated, annoyed. What is going on here? Then here, the next thing comes here. The text comes and answer to a question. Somebody, is not Pharisees actually. But different people are asking questions. Because so many doubt come into their heart actually. Because Jesus is doing all these things. You know, we can say even nonsense that Jesus is doing. They couldn't stand with that at all. So these people came and asked this question. John and his disciples taught them how to fast. But your disciples, what are you doing? Yeah, I think that in their mind, they went to the party with the tax collector yesterday. That's their question. Not only eating actually. Because you had fa fasting all the time. Feasting all the time. You have party all the time. That was the question they were asking. So Jesus is answering an answer to the question. And that is the two parables that he brings over there. That is what we look into. And one point there only that we try to understand. I think that this is what God wants us to hear also. At this season of our life. And they ask actually why your disciples are not fasting. Jesus' answer was that very simple. He says there is a time for fasting and there is a time for feasting. There is a time for all these things. The Old Testament law, according to Old Testament, there is only one time the people were supposed to fast. That was the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, in, in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 29 or so, I think. That is only place. But the prophets asked the people to fast many times. They call solemn assembly. What was those places? You all remember that actually. What was the places? It was a response. It was to repent. It was to come back to God. That was the reason the prophets asked them to, to, to fast. Even the people in Nineveh, people in the, 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 the pagan people, even God asked to repent and come to, come to God. There were times that we see that. So the Old Testament fast was a response, not was a ritual. The Old Testament fast was a response, not just as a ritual. But you know what the Pharisees did with this? We all know that. What they did? They overtaxed it. They forced the people. The Pharisees fast twice a week. And what they do? They make sure that others will know they are fasting also. So they take their picture and put on the Facebook nowadays. You know, that kind of a thing. They do all kinds of stuff. And say actually they stand on the public places. Look, their face so sad. And with these torn clothes and all say that. Oh, why are you? I'm just fasting. You know? So, you know, very pious. You know, you see that people become so spiritual. They don't talk as normal after that. 
their sound will change their face will so droopy and all kinds of things and all before you become spiritual become a human being then you become spiritual after that many people forget that thing actually they forget they are humans they become spiritual they are not used for anyone else after that at all that's what the pharisees does so they want other people their question is that not only that we are doing this why others are not doing it that is a problem you can do anything you want no problem you fast seven days a week you get at five o'clock in the morning and pray and do all kinds of problem no problem at all but you think that that is a measure of spirituality for other people i have a problem with you don't bring those things here at all that has nothing to do with the, the new testament christianity at all that is the reason so they brought this question asked jesus and jesus answer is that now the bridegroom is with them this is a time of celebration but there is a time is going to come they are going to fast and that is what we read in matthew chapter 6 also jesus taught how not to fast and how to fast also so fasting is what that is self denial it is not only that you go without food for this many days god is going to answer and god is obligated after that that's not what it is don't misunderstand that many people think that you know i don't need for this many days so god is supposed to do something for me no you get ulcer that is it there is nothing more than that but if you don't pray there is a requirement in these places and understand that don't bring your superstition and the baggage of the other religion and faith to these things no jesus said, what is this? this is self denial that is a time of setting priorities and you leave your appetite of the flesh to go and wait upon the lord those are the times are powerful times that is what we have done that is what we do we believe in that but that's not a ritualistic thing either so jesus is answering to that question and he gives two parables over there we all know that the parables of jesus it is not illustrations by the way these are the tools jesus taught the other people what he is trying to tell about the kingdom of god the parables are like like windows he opened the door what happened the windows open you are able to see a big thing out there that is what jesus is doing he is opening the window and show them the mind of god the will of god how the kingdom operate some other times the parables are used like a mirror you are able to see the contrasts how the things work in the kingdom of god and how you act and react that is what jesus is doing over here so jesus gave two illustrations or two uh, parables sorry two parables over there one parable you know both of the parables we know very well what is the parable first parable is that you will not patch with the unshrunk cloth with the the new one with the old one nowadays you know the, the pants are all patched work anyway so you pay for that also right so that's what it says actually so what happened with the old cloth the old cloth was just used and used and used and it has no place actually it, it was already shrunk you know you buy the stuff and after you wash a couple of times it becomes shrunk so there is a hole over there you put a new cloth patch over there what happened the new cloth start to two, two piece start to shrunk so the hole become bigger that is one example one parable the other parable jesus says that you know we don't understand much of it you know i don't drink wine i don't know what about wine much of it actually but try to understand these things what happen it is like a old wine skin it is made out of a leather and after use that was stressed and everything and when you put a new wine into this old wine skin or this bottle what happened the fermentation due to the fermentation the chemical process what happened this uh, is start to explode it start to get and the lack of elasticity and lack of flexibility the wine skin start to burst and jesus says that what happened because of that the wine skin will be broken and the wine also will be spin out spill out so what do you do so nobody will put new wine into the old wine skin nobody will put old new wine into the old wine skin so in order to put a new wine into the new wine skin then both will be safe it has enough elasticity and flexibility to accommodate in the process that is happening inside of it that is the parable that jesus said what does that mean then that is a question that we ask to ourselves and what does that mean to us he is about uh, about us or about of course what jesus says there are four meanings that we can see from this thing number one jesus shows his kingdom is different it will not fit the old form jesus kingdom is different 
it will not fit with the old old form jesus tell them that he did not preach an improved judaism or judaism reloaded or judaism 2.0 that is what what jesus came to to do that's what he says he says that he came to do a new living way is a new approach of everything his kingdom is different he wants them to get the message that the gospel and the law or the old ceremonial things will not go hand in hand it is totally different that is what exactly he says there so jesus says that first of all the kingdom is different it will not fit in the old form at all and he says that he didn't come to reupholster your old thing you remember that what happened our sofa broke down we what do you do you know we got a sofa actually and we 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 bought for a good price and uh, it is just all of us and we moved here that time the sun hit on that it was it was not uh, leather it is a, the other thing actually just in a duplicate leather so so it uh, it was start to grow i thought no problem we'll, we'll do a covering over actually i went to different upholstery places so they are asking three times more the price than the original stuff actually and that's why i said no no we don't want to do do that at all so sometimes what we do you know we cover it up the things jesus says that i didn't come to a reupholstery or a remodel none of those things i came to do a new thing that didn't understand that that's one thing the number two thing same thing number two jesus says that jesus reject a patchwork approach to the kingdom of god that's we may stop a little more time jesus go with the path jesus says that he reject the patchwork approach to the kingdom of god because jesus himself said in mark chapter 2 itself that we see it is not the healthy need of the doctor but who need the doctor it is the sick people so jesus i came searching after whom sinners not to the self righteous people i didn't come to compliment the self righteous rather i came to win the the sinners that's what he came so jesus came to introduce a new living way so this is where we have to stop and say remember that actually as believers this is our experience so i don't know what what background you came from to christ but it was sort of improved lifestyle here that god is want to do our story our testimony is what in ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 through 10 that is our testimony ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 through 10 you all know that story very well we learn ephesians so many places and small groups and other places what is that ephesians 2 1 to 10 says that you were dead in your trespasses and sins you were dead in your trespasses and sins so let me ask you this question what is a dead person need if somebody is dead and their body is here you come and give them a very good illustration they will be very happy with that give me a good example help them some improvement self improvement to help them okay forget about all those things give them self you know, self esteem stuff to them some motivational speak actually it will help them no none of those things will not help at all example or motivation or illustrations encouragement no matter what kind of thing you give it is not going to help at all remember that what happened then in in ephesians chapter 2 verse 4 and 5 there we read actually be god because god is rich in his mercy he made us alive god made us alive as dead people we were dead in our trespasses and sins brothers and sisters that is our testimony that is our past what happened then god because of his mercy came he didn't try to improve our life he didn't just change us you know just here and there it was not just make some adjustments no what did god did he gave us life he gave us life that is what we are sitting here this morning if it is not that should be our story that is what we read nicodemus went to jesus in john chapter 3 and he gave a compliment to jesus teacher you are very good you know, i like your sermons you know, wonderful you know i like that you are awesome you know and not only that you are doing this miracles also if it is not you are not from god you can do any of those things that is awesome if it is me i said thank you please come to my church you know we are happy about it right what did jesus answer in john chapter 3 3 that is great <laughs> thank you for the compliment unless you born again you cannot even see that is a, that is a key word there actually you cannot even see the kingdom of god many of you have no clue what is happening here at all 
Many of you have no clue after reading all these things. Why? It is not your fault. It is not our fault in that sense. What happened then? Unless you don't born again, you cannot even see how the kingdom work. You don't even see how the kingdom of God operate. That is an important thing. So that is what we have to ask actually. You know, are you coming here? Are you doing all these things? That is wonderful. Are you are just trying to be more nice? A good Christian? Or you understand that I am born again into the kingdom of God? Is there a genuine change that ever happened into me? That is an important question I think that we have to ask. Not only just to become a reupholstery or remodel. Gospel is not a self-improvement program by the way. It is not about us in that sense. Rather this is about our eternity. This is very important. 100 years from now, most of the people will not be here. I think that all of us won't be here in this room. 100 years from now. It doesn't matter how you feel about me. It doesn't matter how you think about the church at that point. It doesn't matter you like it or not. There is only one thing that matters, brothers and sisters. There is a day you and I understand before him. You are going to stand before him. And you have to give an answer to everything you and I have done. The only question to answer is that, did you understand the gospel as it is? Are you willing to make that change? Are you willing to accept it? That's the only question. Doesn't matter. I, 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 am so, I, I appreciate all of you. We love you and we want to be together. We want to be a group of nice people. But if you are not born again, you cannot even see the kingdom of God. And you will end up in eternal hell. You heard that? You will end up in eternal hell. And you can say that in Matthew chapter 7, I says that I have done this, I have done that, I have did all kinds of stuff. You remember that I adjusted my life. That's all right. But this is the process that we read in the Bible. In, in Ephesians chapter 2, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. But God made us alive with the Christ. And what happened because of that? There is a change that happens. And then what happened then? That is where when you born again, your container become clean. And God says that I will pour out my new spirit in you. This was a sermon that Peter preached in Acts chapter 2 verse 38. And the response to the Pentecost. Remember that? The Holy Spirit came the day of Pentecost. And people run and ask them what shall we do to be saved? The answer he said, repent and believe and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So you need the new wine. You cannot live with your own effort. You cannot do with your self-will. What do you have to do? You have to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, the new wine. Then only we are able to be transformed and live. And Jesus says that I am willing to give that. If you ask, I will give you. The condition is this in Acts chapter 2. Peter says that you believe and be baptized. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus moved into our heart, what happened then? Then there is a change that happens. So gospel is not just a self-improvement program. It is not about how you feel good about the church. It is not feel, feel good about the things. How you feel about good about yourself even. That is not the question ultimately. It is a good news. What makes it a good news, by the way? This is not just another counseling. This is not just an, another advice. This is a good news. What makes gospel good news? Because the Bible says that you know, God is willing to change a sinner into a saint. You know, you are able to become a child of God. How does that happen? God sent his son, took the wrath upon him. So the greatest message there is the wrath of God. The wrath of God should be upon our lives. That wrath is taken upon him. So that you are able to enter into the kingdom of God. That is a free gift. That is a good news. Otherwise you can go to another council and see. Get a good advice. So Jesus says that gospel. The kingdom of God is not a patchwork thing. I try to adjust some of those things. It is a totally new thing. And Jesus says that you cannot mix Jesus and your old ways. You cannot mix Jesus and religion. You can miss Jesus and willpower. That is something new. Jesus reject totally the patchwork approach to the kingdom of God. Why? The reason third is this. God wants a relationship, not just rituals. God wants a relationship, not just rituals. With the rituals, you know what happened? 
We feel so good about it. That is what, after December 31st, we pray the Lord, come now. I am so clean now, take me home. <laughs> so, you know, after do things, we become so, feel so good. Because what happened? Oh, look at me today, I read the Bible. I, I, don't, know, I don't know about you, you know, I am a normal person. And some days we don't, cannot read the Bible or things and all, we get busy and all. We feel a little miserable and sometimes we're tired, you know, we go to bed and things. The next day we read the Bible and all, do the devotion and quiet time and all. I look up at you, look at me. <laughs> you know, I feel so holy that day, right? That's why we, so that is what sometimes rituals does to us. But God is not looking for ritual. God is looking for a relationship. Relationship. In Micah chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. And in the Old Testament, this is what God is asking a question to the people of Israel. And that's uh, verse, verse 6 through 8. Will the Lord be pleased with the thousands of rams, with the ten thousands rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? What are the three things? To act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly before your God. You can offer sacrifices, no problem. That is what David, after his sin, what he said. Lord, I understand now you don't desire sacrifices. I can do these things and live in disobedience. There is no point of what so. I can impress all of you. But my heart is not right with God. There is no point whatsoever at all. Rabbi Zacharias used to say, he said like this. You know, when uh, uh, Moses gave 630 laws, David brought to 15. I see about to 11. Micah go to 3. When a scribe asked to Jesus, what is the greatest command? He said, love the Lord with all your heart, mind and strength with all your being and love. Your neighbor as you yourself. 6.30 to 15, to 11 to 3 to 1. What is it? Love the Lord, relationship. All the prophet, all the laws and everything comes to one thing what? Love the Lord. It is relationship. These people, if the Pharisee is trying to keep up their scores with other people, look at me. Remember that Jesus talked about the prayer in Luke, Luke chapter 18. And there is a tax collector and a, and a Pharisee went to the church to pray. What was the prayer? One guy prayed to himself because compared to that person, he was so nice. But the other person said, I am not worthy to look to heaven. Remember that church this morning. It is not about, you know, I, really, I want all of you to be here 52 weeks. We want to do the things together. But God, what is looking from our heart is our relationship with the with him, that is what God is looking. That is what, because Jesus said, love and obedience go hand in hand. Love and obedience goes. You know, when we sing, we say, oh, I love the Lord. That is wonderful. But the question is that, do you obey him? But Jesus said this in John chapter 14, 15. If you love me, you will obey my. If you love me, you obey my commands. And John who heard that, later he says, why I do this is because first he loved us. That is what it is. It is not a sentimental feeling. Rather it is a relationship built upon God's word. In according to his will. Obey his word. It is not just the other way. Why oh, obey and obey and obey. God is so impressed with me. There is two motivations that you can obey. One is love. The other one is fear of judgment. Both are needed. Both are needed. But the one thing that motivates us as a Christian is what? Our service, our obedience, our sacrifice, our giving. Everything is based upon our love towards him. Because he has loved us first. So Jesus tells his disciples or these scribes. And I believe that this is unto us. God says this. It is God is not looking for just rituals. And how smart you are do the things. Rather God is looking for relationship. And he is rejecting the patchwork approach to the kingdom of God and our life. God is asking for a total change into our heart. That is what leads to the fourth thing. What Jesus says, same thing we repeat. Jesus came or wants to transform, not to reform. Jesus wants to transform, not to reform. What is the difference over there? Reformation is an act of correcting or amending our life and manners or anything. That vicious or corrupt. That is external. It is because of other pressure. But transformation is the act of changing from inside out. 
the words that is used in various places or various uh, realms that is used one place that we all we know that metamorphosis that is a word it is used that is a caterpillar become a beautiful butterfly so there's internal change that is the same word that is used over there that is a word that the bible used about transformation in that sense in in uh, in roman chapter 12 and all it is from inside out it is changed from one form to another as pastor john was here he quoted many many times he can break an egg by external force or he can become a chicken a live thing from inside out that is what we talk about here with external pressure you can do so many things fear of this and that all kinds of stuff or will power and discernment and honor discipline all those things but it is not what the bible says about this metamorphosis is inside out other word that is used about a transmutation that means that is a changing from one metal to another copper to gold in that sense that is an inside out the catholics those who believe in communion they talk about transubstantiation they believe that when the priest pray the elements become the blood and body of jesus christ that's what they believe so this all a transformation changing from inside out that happen so reformation is an external thing okay when there is a ceremony you heard or read the bible or do the devotion or something happened maybe because of that you are willing to change because of those things but that's what god says here if the pharisee is trying to put all the rules and try to push the people into that but what happen when there is no one else they will be able to do other things also but here jesus says no that's not what i came to do i didn't came to do this external things but i came to change from inside out that is what the bible says if a man in christ he is a new creation if a man in christ he is a new creation reformation is a result of trying but transformation is a result of trusting so we trust god there is a new thing that works through us now i am not able to do it but the holy spirit enabling me to do it that is a question that we have to ask actually am i am i trying to become a good christian or i understand that i live in christ that is a world of difference i am not trying to be a good christian rather i know that christ the hope of glory who dwells in me i live in christ christ lives in me and jesus word was abide in me and paul explained that was actually interpreting it and he says that live in him and he lives in us i will not be able to do anything that i say but only i can do is because of him that is what god is looking from us it is not only by the external force and pressure god wants to transform us so that is what salvation is all about you know there is so many places and people you may be seeing out there they may be saying this and doing other thing they claim they are christians and doing other things also that is none of my business not none of our business but salvation in its essence is a change do you agree that salvation in its essence is a change because change by definition is a departure from the past definition change by definition is a departure from the past so salvation is a change from death to life from darkness to light from sinner to saint from the children of wrath to the object and vessels of mercy that's a beautiful frame in roman chapter 9 that we read god made us the vessels of mercy we were the children of wrath in ephesians chapter 2 but god changed us that is what salvation is my question our question to ask to ours is actually is that genuine salvation ever took place into my life my question is and not are you coming my question are you attending small group and my question is not are you baptized even in that sense the question is this brother sister that genuine transformation ever took place in our heart do you have the conviction that the holy spirit lives in me do we have the understanding that i am a born again christian in that sense that is a question we have to ask so we have to ask this question we all are sinners by nature and by choice so god wants to change us but many times we resist the change because of habit because of fear because of loss of control or because of it is costly but remember there is a price more than that we have to give in hebrew chapter 9 3 verse 7 and 9 I will read and finish over there. And there we the Hebrew warnings that we read. 
One of the warnings that was given is this. Hebrew 3 verses 7 through 9. So as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as you did in the rebellion. This example that was used from the Old Testament. The people those who want to go to the Canaan of rest. But they came half of the way and said they don't want to. Do it or go. That was a question they are trying to say. Then God giving the, the, new, the, the new Testament. He, the author of Hebrews giving a warning. Do not harden your heart. God wants to take you to your destiny. So don't harden, harden your heart. When God is opening his heart to us. Our response should always to be willing heart. So Jesus says. You, I want to pour out this new wine. But I cannot put it into the old wine skin. If you genuinely believe that you need a transformation and change, why did it start? It start to change the container, change the wine skin itself. So that is the question that God is asking. So this is maybe simple one way, but I believe this is serious also. Because we cannot go further, any step, without understanding that God is working in me, I am willing to obey him. We cannot go one more step. Because tomorrow is not belongs to us at all. So I encourage you, examine our heart, as Paul says to Corinthians. You know, where do we stand? I am just satisfied with this old thing. And everyone, those who hear me this morning, remember this. We all need a next level of obedience. Next level. Of, repentance is not only for the people out there, folks. It is to all of us. When the Holy Spirit was writing to the letter uh, to the, the churches in Asia in Revelations. To every church, not to the outsiders, where it says, we sometimes, you know, quote those scriptures very, you know, we, we misquote that scripture many times. Every place that we read, repent. Repent and know where you fell from the first place, lost your first love. We all know, need the next level of obedience. This morning, I believe this with all my heart. This is what God wants to hear us this morning. Would you please pray? Together this morning. I want a change. I want a transformation. Not from outside, from inside. This morning I surrender my life for that. Would you please pray. Jesus didn't come. His kingdom cannot be added to the old forms. The kingdom concept is itself. These people just want a rescue from their, their, their enemies. That's all the Pharisees or the Jewish people looked. The sad part is, you know what? These people spend all their life to study the law. To search for the Messiah. Spend their effort for this. Brilliant people, not just ordinary people. Disciplined people. Meticulous in their obedience. But they missed the Messiah. Because they search the Messiah in their own terms. I think that is one of the mistakes they did. This morning... I just want you to, to think about this. Are you searching God in your own terms? You say that this is the way I used to think. This is what I used to taught. This is what I, it was learned. No matter what it is, I will not change at all. There is a time maybe, you know, as Paul says to Corinthians, when I was a child, I thought like a child. But now I am mature. I forsake the childish things. So Jesus reject the idea, the patchwork approach to the kingdom of God. You cannot be this and that. You can only be one. Remember this brothers, sisters. My dear brothers and sisters. Remember that. One day you and I have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We can have excuses here. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10. Paul says about the Rayama. It is the, the Bema seat of Christ. And he says. We all have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Whatever we have done while we are on the body, good or bad, we have to give an account to that. So that is what it matters. I want to stay when I stand before the Lord, I am answerable to each of your souls. That is a solemn responsibility that cringes me many times. So I say the whole counsel of God to you this morning. We cannot have a patchwork approach, we cannot be this and that. Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters at the same time. You will forsake one and follow the other. So just make that choice now before it is too late.
God says, God is concerned not about rituals. You can teach or preach or sing or give or go. Do many things. And think that I equate my service to my obedience. God says, I am not impressed with any rituals at all. Millions of animals, rivers of blood, all those things never impress God. But when we are contrite, broken, with the goldly sorrow of our sin, the Bible says that heaven rejoice. God is looking for a relationship, not just rituals, not to put the points. I will be happy to see all of you and do things, but only God knows our heart. Jesus says, love and obedience go hand in hand. If you love me, he will automatically obey my commands also. You don't want to hurt somebody that you love. When you know that he loved you to give you a last drop of his blood, I come surrendering to him and say, Lord, I don't have any words. Why you love me this much? It is because of the sheer mercy of God. That's it. God says, I want to transform you, not just reform you. Repentance, we talk of some other time, repentance is a total turnaround. These are basic stuff I know. But I believe the Holy Spirit was reminding us during this season of prayer, we cannot go further without settle these basic matters first. In your family, in your personal life, as a congregation, we are a family. We cannot go further with this and that. Let's come to the one point. I can, we can say funny things make you happy and you feel good when you leave this place. But we have to give an answer to that. The authority of the scripture, the sovereignty of God, that is the motivation every time that we declare this word. Would you please pray this morning as, as, as we read in Hebrews, do not harden your heart. Do not harden your heart. Every time when God calls you for repentance, you know what He's doing? He shows His mercy to you again. God shows His mercy to us again. That is what He is doing. Love mercy. Walk humbly. Do justice. We'll pray when the time is up, I know. Uh, but this was a burden that the Lord has put in my heart. Because I have the ability to talk to you now. I can prepare everything, but what happens, I can't speak. I have all the resources, but I don't know how I can comprehend. So every time I think that this can be the last sermon, we don't know. You will hear a sermon again, or I will preach a sermon again. It's a serious thing. Our eternity cannot be hanged on our assumptions. How to have an assurance that I am a child of God. Hallelujah. Would you please pray this morning? Any one of you make a commitment in the next level of obedience. I think that I need obedience in various ways. We all need that. We all need that. The next level of obedience. That was one of the words the Lord spoke to so clearly many times in the fire. The next level of obedience. Not be satisfied who I am doing and compared to many other, I may be better. But the question is not I am compared to whom. That is a relative thing. Would you please pray, Lord, lead me to the next level of obedience. Out of my love towards you, share the gospel with other people. If you believe the gospel is true, the people, those who don't believe in Jesus, will go to eternal hell. How passionate you and I will become to share with others. We have all kinds of excuses. What is our excuse? Our business. What is our busy? Because of the gift God has given us, we are more concerned about it than the giver. That's what it is. That's as simple as it is. This morning, let's come back to the Lord and say as a church, Lord, give me the boldness and burden to share. Would you please pray? If God has spoken to you this morning, if you want somebody to pray with you, the elders are here to pray. And not only when you have a physical need and, and you come and pray. Sir, you pray that I...